Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. Today we're going to be looking at the 2021 set one of microeconomics. This is, these are the FRQs. Uh, this is an unboxing video. I just got these questions a few hours ago. I went through and I did my best to answer the questions and I'm gonna show you what I came up with. I don't know if my answers are going to be officially correct to the rubric. Um, I'm doing the best I can. Um, I don't always, these ones were really hard, by the way. <laughs> this year, the, these questions, at least some of them, were quite tricky. Uh, but they're working to try to differentiate the fours from the fives, from the threes, from the twos, from the ones. And so they do have a wide range of, of questions here. And they were tough, even, even for me. So, um, uh, so I, we're going to go through them. And I want to show you, everybody, what I came up with. I don't work for the college board. I've got no inside information though. Uh, so this is just what I think. And then we'll find out once the rubrics are released, what the actual answers were and, and find out how well I did, right? So let's get into it. So question number one, we have uh, the government of, I, of an island nation grants Skyrunner Airlines exclusive monopoly rights to serve the island. Skyrunner is earning a positive economic profit. So first thing we have to do is draw a properly labeled graph and show the following for Skyrunner. We have to show the profit maximizing quantity of tickets labeled QM, profit maximizing price of a ticket labeled PM, and the area uh, representing the profits that they're making. And we need to shade that completely. So here's my answer for that one. We have our downward sloping demand curve, marginal revenue below. This is a monopoly graph that is showing an economic profit. ATC is below the demand curve at the profit maximizing quantity. You have to have that profit maximizing quantity marked. It's QM, you find it where MR equals MC. Drop down till you find that quantity. Then for the price, you go all the way up to the demand curve and then over to the price axis, label that one PM. And then the profit box is the gap between the demand curve and that average total cost curve until you get to the axis, it should be shaded completely, right? So that's my part for A. Moving on to part B. Uh, so we have now that the Islands Tourist Bureau is asking the government to consider the two following proposals. They could either set a price ceiling on tickets that eliminates all deadweight loss. Remember, monopolies have deadweight loss. Or proposal number two is to eliminate Skyrunner's monopoly rights, which will remove all barriers to entry. All right, so first part for B, we are going to suppose that the uh, government adopts proposal number one. So on our graph, we're going to indicate the quantity of tickets sold in the short run, and we'll label that QC. And that is a price ceiling that eliminates all deadweight loss. So that would be setting price to marginal cost. Where do you find that? Well, you find it where the demand curve intersects that marginal cost curve. So right there, that is where there would be no deadweight loss. That is the allocatively or socially optimal quantity, and you label it QC. There you go. Suppose instead that the government adopts proposal number two. How will each of the following be affected in the long run uh, compared to the market conditions in part A? Now, for a lot of this, I think there are a few different ways you could go with it that seem a little bit reasonable. I decided that it was probably best to assume that although all barriers to entry were eliminated, there would still be some differentiation between the firms. I just thought the explanations were a little easier that way. So that's the route I'm going with this. I think you could do this same answer by making some under, underlying assumptions that we go to perfect competition, uh, but similar, you would get similar answers and, I, and I'm hopeful that both will be acceptable under the rubrics. So uh, first, so for part I, I say decrease. So the quantity of tickets that Skyrunner is going to sell will decrease. And here's my explanation. You can tell that my underlying assumption here is that it kind of becomes a monopolistically competitive market. So it will just go to breaking even. So because uh, as firms enter the market seeking those profits, remember they are earning economic profits, Skyrunner's market share will decrease and that will shift the demand and marginal revenue leftward right? as they have fewer, uh, a smaller size, size of the market or smaller share of the market, they have fewer customers and that will decrease their demand, shifting the marginal revenue curve with it and that decreases the MR equals MC quantity. There you go. So that's my answer for that one. For the next part for II, I say that with it will become more elastic. So the question here is the price elasticity of demand for Skyrunner's airline services and explain that. And so if you are assuming that it becomes 
perfectly competitive, well, then it's going to be horizontal or perfectly elastic. I was having trouble coming up with the explanations exactly why. And so I just thought it was easiest to just say this, say it this way. It becomes more elastic because there will be more substitutes in the market. All right. That's the mechanism. The greater number of substitutes is the reason why it becomes more elastic. So there you go. Uh, for part three there, Skyrunners profits, they're going to decrease all the way down to zero, right? I don't know if they will require you to say that it goes down to zero, but whether, no matter which way you're looking at this, it decreases down to zero. And for the next part, dead weight loss in the market, it will decrease. Now, if you think it's going to a perfectly competitive market, it would decrease down to zero, uh, but, uh, but obviously there is still some dead weight loss in the, um, in a uh, in monopolistically competitive firms, but in the overall market, we're going to see the supply in the market increase, and that brings the market closer to the socially optimal quantity. Right. So, yeah, I I don't know if this was the best route for me to go. I thought this was just the easiest way to explain it. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what the rubric says when this one comes out. So, if you struggled on this one, don't worry, I did too. Uh, my I wanted to go perfect competition, but I was having trouble with some of the explanations, so I decided to go uh, monopolistic competition instead. Thought it was easier this way. And I think that they are both reasonable given the uh, way the question is phrased. We have a reduction of barriers to entry. It doesn't say anything about, uh, about differentiation, and I don't think that that's necessarily breaking ceteris paribus, but we'll see, we'll see, right? <laughs> so I could see my answer being considered wrong too. We'll see, sometimes you just gotta figure out where you, they want you to go as, and do the best you can. So for part two, uh, assume that Schmidt Inc. provides car parking services in a perfectly competitive output market and hires labor in a perfectly competitive input market. The market price per car parked is $10. The daily market wage per worker is $100 and fixed costs are $50 per day. The table right there, it's not above, but uh, the way I made it. So the workers are required to park different quantities of cars per day. First, we're gonna calculate the marginal revenue product of the second worker and we're going to show our work. So that second worker, you see that the marginal product or the number of parked cars, the total product that is, goes from eight cars to 20 cars. We're going to take that 20 minus eight, that's a marginal product of 12, multiply it by $10 per parked car. That gives us a marginal revenue product of $120. There you go. Next, it says, how many workers will Schmidt Inc. hire to maximize profit? Relative to this number of hired workers, explain why Schmidt Inc. will not hire one additional worker. And your answer must use marginal analysis and numbers from the table. So basically as it's phrased, I don't think it's required to talk about the reasons why the first, the number chosen is, is chosen. They're focusing more on the reasons why the second one is chosen or is not chosen or the next one is not chosen. But I included both of them in my answer. It's the answer is four and it's because the marginal revenue product of the fourth workers of, of four workers, excuse me, is, uh, is, 45 minus 34, and that's a, times 10. And that gives us a marginal revenue product of 110, which is more than the marginal resource cost or marginal factor cost of $100. And at five workers, we're not gonna hire that fifth worker because the marginal revenue product is 54 minus 45, and that is nine marginal product times $10 gives us a marginal revenue product of $90 which is less than the marginal factor cost or marginal resource cost of $100, All right? So that worker, you'd actually, this firm would lose $10 by hiring that fifth worker. All right, next one. Calculate the daily profit for Schmidt Inc. at the profit maximizing quantity we identified in part B. All right, so here we go for part B. Just a little reminder, back to part B. We have our four workers. Four workers is where we're at, which means they are producing 45 parked cars. So let's see their total revenue, 45 cars parked times $10 gives us $450 of total revenue. Our total cost is the four workers times the $100 plus a fixed cost of $50. That means our total cost is $450. Total revenue minus our total cost gives us our economic profit of zero. All right. So there you go, zero profits. 
Uh, for D, suppose new legislation requires each worker in the parking industry to purchase an individual insurance policy at the worker's expense in order to legally park cars. Will the wage rate pay, will the wage, market wage paid by a typical firm in this industry increase, decrease, or stay the same in the long run? Right, if workers are expected to purchase a license to be able to legally park these cars, well, that's going to decrease the supply of labor within the worker, the parked car, the park car, the, <laughs> the valet market, right? Uh, the car parker market. Uh, and, uh, and so that is going to increase the wage, right? You bring that over to the market, Next question, next, there you go, increase. So it'll increase the wage, by the way. All right, so moving on to the second part there. For a typical firm in the industry, will the number of workers hired in the short run increase, decrease, or stay the same and explain? So because that wage is going to increase, we are going to see a decrease in the number of workers each firm hires, and that's because the marginal resource cost increased causing a decrease in the MR equals MC, MRP, MRC equals MRP quantity, right? Remember marginal revenue product downward slopes and we're just on a higher price level up there on the marginal revenue product, which is actually at a lower quantity when you graph it out, all right? Moving on to the next question. Last question in this set. The diagram above shows the market for corn in the country of microland. Corn is, a produ is produced and sold in a constant cost, perfectly competitive market. First, we're going to calculate the total revenue earned by corn farmers at the market equilibrium price, and we're gonna show our work, all right? Remember, total revenue is price times quantity. There you go, price times quantity. The price equilibrium price is $5, and the equilibrium quantity is 50. Plug in the numbers and do the math, we've got $250 of total revenue. Next up, part B, in an attempt to assist corn farmers in microland, the government sets a price floor, $7 price floor on corn. How many bushels of corn will be exchanged at the price floor? Well, let's go ahead and plug in that price floor right there. Remember that it, the quantity exchanged will always be the lower quantity, all right? We have a higher quantity supplied than quantity demanded at that price of $7. That means we have a surplus, but they can't sell more than we are willing to buy. So it's the lower quantity of the two. In this case, it is the quantity demanded, which is 30 units. So there you go. You don't have to show any math or any explanation. It's just 30. I just identify it. All right, and now you get that by going till you hit the demand curve. That's the lower first one we hit and dropping down. That's a quantity of 30. The quantity supplied, of course, is 70 units, but we don't get that quantity. We aren't willing to buy that many at that higher price. All right, for the second part of this, we're going to calculate the dead weight loss that is associated with the price floor and show our work. Remember, the dead weight loss is found at the current quantity we're producing, which is 30. You go up till you find the marginal cost of that quantity, which is the supply curve. Keep going till you find the marginal benefit of that quantity, which is the demand curve. And then the marginal benefit equals marginal cost, marginal social cost quantity is our equilibrium point and that's at 50 units. So you, those are your three points of your dead weight loss triangle. It's right there, you see it there. So you're gonna calculate it, it's the base of 20 and we have a height of $7 minus $3 of four. Multiply that together, then divide it by two or times it by a half, it gives us $40 worth of dead weight loss as a result of this price floor. Next up, we're going to talk about the, uh, we're going to have a new assumption. Assume that the government agrees to buy any unsold quantity at $7 and we're going to calculate the producer surplus and show our work. I think there's an, a, a temptation here to just assume that we go to, long, to, go to that equilibrium uh, point and have 50 units of output, but no, the government has agreed to buy all unsold products at $7, which means that the full quantity supplied will get produced and the suppliers will be compensated for that. So that means we have a big giant triangle. We're actually gonna get 70 units supplied and that will be the producer surplus, that whole triangle there, right? So we're going to go ahead and calculate the area of that triangle. It's 70 times seven times a half, which is $245. This one might, you might have wanted a calculator, but <laughs> you could have done it if you, uh, at least if your math skills are like mine are sometimes, right? But you should have been able to get it with a calculator if you jotted down your answers and stuff, right? Maybe you needed some scratch paper. All right. Next, for part, 
IV. So we've got uh, to assume that the price floor and government buying program remain in effect. In addition, we're going to assume that the demand for corn does not change. In the long run, will the quantity of corn purchased by the government increase, decrease, or remain the same? Explain. Now I gotta admit, I had some trouble thinking of what possibly could be going on here on this one, but here's where I landed, right? Here's where I landed, and I think it helps if you kind of make an assumption that we started. Remember, this is kind of a perfectly competitive industry we've got going on, or it is a perfectly competitive industry. So I think it helps and assume, to assume that we're starting at long run equilibrium. I know it doesn't say that, but I think that just works with the logic a little bit better. Uh, that often is the assumption in economics and microeconomics that we're at, we're, we're always starting at and moving to equilibriums. So, uh, equilibria. So we're going to go ahead, and that's where my assumption is here. So I say, increase and it's because when that government program goes into effect it's going to increase profits for individual firms so i put increase because the government action will increase profits causing firms to enter the market which will of course increase supply right so that's where i'm going with that and that's why i say it will increase right so and again on this one i'm not exactly sure where they're going with it but that's where i'm falling down and i and maybe I can't, couldn't think of some other explanations. I know in the past on macro specifically, they accepted other, exp uh, other uh, types of logic than what the most obvious one was in my opinion. And it, they accepted it according to the rubric as long as you had a proper explanation. So maybe they'll accept other things. I don't know, but this is where I landed, right? There we go, so that's my answers. Take them what they're worth, which might not be much. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed this school year. I really appreciate you watching my channel. If you, uh, if you know anybody taking microeconomics or macroeconomics next year, please encourage them to use reviewecon.com. Use my YouTube channel as well. And of course, if they want to support me and support my channel, tell them to purchase the Total Review booklet. It has lots of worksheets and activities and cheat sheets. It has graph cheat sheets and formula cheat sheets and, um, and it has practice exam along with some exclusive online games as well. And uh, it's a big help to helping run ReviewEcon.com. I really appreciate it. You guys have a good summer. I'll see you guys next time.